Oh, okay. Good morning. Good to see you guys. Those are some pictures of Israel that came up behind us. I'd love for you to take your Bible and turn in it to John chapter 14. If you own a Bible, bring it with you. We'll use it every week when we're together. If you don't own a Bible, we'll give you one before you leave today. If you don't have one with you, there's one under a chair close to you. John chapter 14. Speaking of under a chair, you're on a chair and you're either sitting on or you moved it or holding in your hand a little booklet. From now on, they'll be in the foyer. But uh, we just want you to have that. I hope that if you're a part of this church, that you'll take it and read it. Like every word, every picture, it's telling a story. It's encouraging to me to see what God's done in the life of our church and then what we want to do. So we wrote this, uh, not as a decoration for your seat, but as some information for you to take and uh, read. So I hope that you'll do that. And we want to be a part of a very generous church, and we are. We want to do more and more, and there's some things that God's calling us to do that we can only do if all of us are doing what God has called each of us individually to do, which is giving. It's a part of our life as followers of Jesus. It's just what we do. Even other religions do it, and I hate what they're giving to, but I love what Jesus people give to, and Jesus people give, and we give. When we give, it reminds us that God owns everything that we have, and he owns it all, and we just give back to him some of what we have. Giving reminds us that God's the owner, and we give to gospel things first because it reminds us that the gospel is the most important thing on the planet. It's the thing that's going to change lives now and eternally, and so we need to be givers. If you're not giving yet, you don't like what I'm saying, but you should, and you will because if you keep following Jesus, he'll get to this point in your life. So let's get there sooner so he can do more work in your life and get past this thing that you've been holding back from him. So let's start giving each one of us. How cool would it be if every one of us in our church was giving as we should? I can tell you that we'd be doing things this next year that we're not doing yet. So, yes, amen. Yeah. Yes, the giver said amen. The non-giver said, please stop. That's why I'm going to keep going. I'm just kidding. Well, let's start giving. Take these books with you. Read it. Get the story in the heart of our church. Hey, congratulations. You made it through Thanksgiving, and you're back. I'm so happy for you. I'm proud of you for getting back here. John chapter 14. Continue reading in verse 1. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If we're not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that'll be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe in the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Verse 1, don't let your hearts be troubled. What is a troubled heart? It's this deep emotional toll on the soul. It's deep emotional toll on the soul. Have you ever had a troubled heart? I have. In fact, good Godly, strong, wise people all throughout Scripture have had troubled hearts. Their souls have been deeply troubled. In history, some of the people that I have learned from the most and love the most and have led me with their words after their death and their life that they lived that's been recorded, they struggled deeply with toll on their soul. Their hearts were troubled. There are people that I follow today that I love, that have mentored me and led me. They have deep toll on their soul. 
You may feel alone as a follower of Jesus and hearts deeply troubled, but you're not. Even King David said in Psalm 42, 5, he was speaking to his own soul and he said, why are you downcast, O my soul? Why are you so troubled within me? I mean, Jesus knows about our soul and he knows it can be troubled. And this is talking about deep trouble. It's not talking about Thanksgiving turkey or presents under a Christmas tree. This is talking about things in our soul that we wrestle with and we don't know how to deal with and we don't know how to move past. And he's about to tell us here what to do when our soul is troubled. He cares deeply about your soul. And there's not one of us here, don't don't believe a lie that you're alone when your soul is troubled. Don't think that the people sitting next to you down down the road or behind you or in front of you, don't think that they also don't have trouble in their soul. Don't think that. Don't listen to somebody on a podcast. Don't learn from somebody. Don't read a book. Don't think that there's a person that you know that hasn't had deep trouble on their soul. And some of us have more than others. But all of us have had deep toll on the soul. And Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Like, hey, look, I, I, I want you to know that you can live and overcome this somehow. I want you to know that you can deal with this. You don't have to just let it go. You can pay attention to it. How, Jesus? What do I do? Because this is just happening to me. And some of us can barely live and barely exist and don't even want to. Don't let your hearts be troubled, Jesus said. What do I do? Tried everything. Well, he said, look at this. Sounds simplistic, but we're talking, we're getting talked to from the one who created our soul who knows it better than anyone else. You go to a counselor for help with your soul, good. You, chemical help if you need that, medicinally, if, if you're off, good. But Jesus made our souls, and he knows them, and he knows what to do. And we have to attach faith to our troubled soul. This is what he says, don't let your hearts be troubled, trust in God, meaning the Father, and then trust also in me. There has to be an element of trust attached to our troubled soul if we're going to pay attention to it. There has to be something with our faith that's going on with our troubled soul. And in our world today, souls are deeply troubled, and many people don't attach Jesus to their troubled soul. They don't attach faith. They don't attach belief. Jesus said, I want you to trust in me. Trust in me. There has to be some trust of Jesus affecting our troubled soul. In fact, Jesus attaches faith to the way forward with our troubled soul. And he attaches these things right here. Look at what he says. Verse two, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. So Jesus says this here. He says, look, here's how I want you to help with your troubled soul. I don't think Jesus is giving us here a solution to say that your soul will never be troubled if you do these things. But I think to not let our, the trouble of our soul control our life, he tells us something here that we need to press into, we need to pay attention to. He's telling us something here because he cares about us. I mean, he's caring about his disciples. He knows what they're about to go through. They're about to go through the worst trial of their lives. They left everything already for Jesus, and now everything's going to be tested. I mean, they're going to go back home and start fishing again or working their other jobs again. Everything that they left for. Now, am I crazy? What did I miss? I thought this was true. I mean, they're about to go through the worst trial of their lives. Their best friend, Jesus, is about to be crucified in front of their eyes. And their lives are threatened, and the lives of their families. So he knows. He's not saying you're never going to go through trouble if you do these things. He's saying do these things when your soul is troubled. And this is what he says right here. Do you see it? Number one, he says, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. Like, there's a place that you will be beyond this place, and I'm preparing it for you right now. There is a place beyond this place that I'm preparing for you. Thought about that lately? Thought about that this year? Do you think about that? Is it your default? When your soul is troubled, do you think, this world's not my ultimate home? 
I'm a stranger here. I'm an alien here, the Bible says. I'm just borrowing this planet for a little while, this body for a little while. I'm just passing through this place. Jesus is preparing a place for me beyond this place. I say, it's hard to be human here. It's hard to be a human in this place. And Jesus says, I'm actually preparing a different place for you you than the place where you are right now. And when your soul is troubled, I mean, these are the words that the one who knit our soul together and knows the condition of our soul caused by the brokenness of this world due to sin, these are the words he's telling us when he's like, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't just let it go off into trouble. These are the words he's saying, yes. So it's got to work. It's got to help. It's got to do something. And he says, I'm preparing a place for you. I right now will be working. You can't see it, but I can. You don't know it, but I want you to know it. I want you to believe me. I want you to trust me that I'm preparing a place for you beyond this place. I mean, he saw all the brokenness of this world. He saw divorce, death, disease, sickness, sadness, suffering, sin. He saw it all. And he says, this is not the place, ultimately. You're not going to live here forever. I'm preparing a place for you. And I'm going to come back. I'm preparing a place for you, and I promise you I'm going to return. I'm going to come back. Now, I mean, we're hearing a lot about the return of Jesus, especially right now. I mean, anything that you read anywhere is attached to people of faith. They're talking about prophecies, and some people are saying, this is what this means, and this is what this means. And we're like, we don't know exactly what it means, but we know it's all going to lead to the point where Jesus, at some point, is going to come back. He stepped into not time out of eternity past. There was no such thing as time. He wasn't aging, watching a clock. He never woke up and he created time. He created days and nights and these things that we live by, calendars that we function by. We have years that mark our lives. He stepped into eternity past and at some point in the future, he will step in again. He promises he'll return. And then he says, you're gonna be with me. I mean, this is it. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. I'm preparing a place for you. I promise I'm gonna return, and you're gonna be in my presence forever. The presence of love, the presence of goodness, the presence of truth, the presence of light, no no sin, nothing touched by sin. There will be a day where we will not anymore ever again because of Jesus, because we'll be in his presence, we will never again be sad. We'll never again have these moments of desperation. Our soul will never be troubled again. This is what Jesus is telling us. For many of us, we're like, I don't ever think about that. I don't ever think that this world is temporary and I'm not gonna live here forever. And this pain that I'm going through, it's it's momentary, the Bible says. It's not gonna last forever. And there has to be something that we believe that Jesus is right now preparing a place for us that we cannot see because this place is not gonna be our ultimate home and he promised he's gonna return one day and we're gonna be in his presence. This is what Jesus tells us to do when our soul is troubled. And then he says, verse four, hey, you know the way where I'm going, you know. You know the way where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? You won't even tell us where you're going. So how can we know the way to go when you haven't told us? And Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way. And he says this famous verse that you should know as a follower of Jesus. I am the way and I am the truth and I am the life. And then he says this, no one comes to the Father except through me. This place I'm talking about that I'm preparing for you in heaven, nobody gets there except through me. Jesus is not here making himself exclusive. He is exclusive. He is not making himself the exclusive way. He is not stepping up and saying, hey, I'm finally, I'm just gonna, I'm taking my rightful place as the exclusive way. He's not making himself exclusive. He is exclusive. And by being the exclusive way to get to God, he excludes any other way. There is no other way to get to God other than Jesus. And as followers of Jesus, we have to guard ourselves in this day and age more than ever. More than your grandparents did, more than your parents did, we have to guard ourselves now more than ever against syncretism and universalism. Here's syncretism. Syncretism is this. Hey, we got Christianity, but we're mixing other stuff in with it. We got Jesus way, but we're putting some other stuff in with it right here. That's what syncretism is. It's Jesus plus something. 
Jesus plus something else. I'm putting things together that's happening everywhere in the Christian world. Be careful who you read. Be careful who you listen to. Be careful who you follow. Watch your friends, because some of them are doing it too. You have to guard against secretism. Jesus plus something. Jesus says here, look, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. He's telling us that's it. There's not another way. It's dangerous to try something else. Why look at something else? Don't even consider something else. There's not another way. It'd be as futile as you saying, hey, you know what? I'm going to go to heaven today. You can't do that. You don't know what's happening. Jesus said, look, there's no other way. There's no other way to be saved. No other way to get to the heaven. No other way to get to Father except through me. He's exclusive. He excludes any other way. We have to guard ourselves against secretism and against universalism especially. And universalism is this. Hey, any way will do to get to God. That way works, that way works, that way works, no way works. Every way is gonna get us to God. And Jesus says, that's not true. It's not true. Don't believe the lie. Don't believe that every way will get to God. I heard a famous person recently say, hey, Jesus is my way to get to God, but I know you have your way. What? No, it's false, it's a lie. I promise you, this is the biggest obstacle, this is the biggest thing coming against Christianity right now, is syncretism and universalism. Jesus plus something, or Jesus... It's my way, but any other way will work just fine. Some of your friends have bought into one of these two things. And there's a thing right now called Christian universalism, which is, hey, Jesus is going to make every way be a way one day. Because of Jesus, he's going to make every way be the way. And so just do whatever you want because Jesus, in the end, is going to take all of it and everybody with him anyway, so it's fine. So people quit following Jesus because they're like, hey, They quit preaching about Jesus because they're like, look, what Jesus is going to do one day is he's going to take us all there anyway, and it's a thing called Christian universalism. I do believe in Jesus, but he's going to take you there anyway, so let's stop preaching about hell because it's really not going to happen. Let's stop preaching about eternity. Let's stop preaching about salvation, and let's just feed the poor, give them water. Let's just start doing that. Jesus here is saying, I think maybe one of the most important verses for you to hold on to and believe and remember is this, I'm the way. I'm the truth, I'm the lie. I didn't get to preach last week. We had a conversation, so I'm like letting it all out real fast today. I hope you're okay with it. (laughs) hope you're following. I'm the way, I'm the way, I am the way. No one gets to the Father except through me. There's no other way. You know what I'm concerned about? I'm concerned about you not believing this. I'm concerned about you not holding on to it. I'm concerned about you being embarrassed about this. I'm concerned about you in conversations with people not saying this. I'm concerned about you saying, hey, my kids will believe whatever they want to. It's not my job to make them believe. And so you don't tell your kids this. This is what I'm concerned about. I'm concerned that our culture has just so slowly gotten into your life that in your conversations about Jesus, mm, you don't say this. Good God gospel conversations don't matter if you don't really believe this. There's no other way for your friends to be saved. There's no other way for them to be rescued from an eternity separated from God. There's no other way for your kids to be saved other than Jesus Christ. Faith in him. That's it. There's no other way. And look, If we don't believe it, let's shut our doors. Let's sell the building. Let's give it all to some nonprofits who are doing some good work. Let's stop preaching this stuff. If you don't believe it, what are you doing here? Or go to many churches, even in our area, who will never say this anymore because they don't want to offend people. I don't want to offend you on your way to hell. So they don't. So they make up another story. Some people will take the words of Jesus here and make it something else, but he's pretty plain. He's pretty clear. He says, I am the way and the truth. No one comes to the Father except for me. Believe John chapter 14, verse 5. And then he says this to his disciples. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and you've seen him. Lord, show us the Father, Philip said. That'll be enough. Don't you know me? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Don't you believe this? 
Like, don't you know me by now? And so he says to his disciples, I thought that we've been together long enough for you to understand this. I thought you've walked with me, heard me teach. I thought we, we knew each other better than this. Like, you've been with me this long, and you don't know this yet? I mean, it, I, I think it's very possible that there are people who, like, you've been in church this long? You've had a Bible this long? You've had the Spirit of God living inside of you this long? And you don't know this yet? Don't you know by now, Jesus said? I mean, a little frustrated with these guys. And he's letting them know that. Don't you know this by now? Like, I... He's not having compassion on them for not knowing it. Like he's putting some responsibility back on them. Don't you know this by now? Like I don't, I don't feel real sorry for you that you've had access to church, access to teaching, access to a Bible. You say that the Spirit of God's been living inside of you for a long time, and you don't know this by now. Whose fault is that? Yours. I don't think it's Jesus is here. I don't think Jesus is going. Man, I should have done a better job teaching these guys. You know, I need to be a better teacher. I don't think Jesus is putting that off on them. Hey, don't you know by now? What's wrong? Why don't you know? And this is what he tells them that they should know by now. I mean, by the way, Jesus wants them to, to know him. Don't you know me? Don't you know me by now? I mean, they know some stuff about Jesus for sure. Oh, remember when Jesus healed this guy? Remember when he fed these people with just a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish? Remember that? I mean, do you remember, do you remember these things about, they know some stuff about Jesus, but he, but he says, don't, don't you know me? Like, that's the point. I mean, the hope that we have for a troubled heart is this presence of Jesus, the person of Jesus, we love him, we want him. I mean, that's our hope, it can heal a troubled heart. And Jesus says, like, you don't know me? You know some stuff about me, but you don't know me? In fact, he he, t- he said this in, in one verse as he's talking about knowing him. He said in Mark chapter 8, verse 36, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Some of us know some things about Jesus, but we don't know him. We know wealth, we know power, we know success, we know pleasure, we know possessions, but we don't know Jesus. Like we've gained a lot in this world and we know some information about Jesus, but Jesus said that, that's the most worthless life you could live. What good would it be for you to get this whole world and forfeit your soul? Jesus says, hey, don't you know me? Don't you know me? Like this is our greatest pursuit to know Jesus. This is, it's better than wealth. It's better than power. It's better than possessions. It's better than pleasure. It's better than success. It's better than stuff. It's knowing Jesus. Like is this what burns in your heart. Jesus, I want to know you. Like the apostle Paul said, I just want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to know the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. If a suffering would get me closer to Jesus, like would give me more fellowship with him, give it to me. I just want to know Jesus. And most of us are like, I just want Jesus to give me a good life. She said, don't you know me? I want you to know me. Please know me. Don't you know me even after I've been among you such a long time, he said? And here's what he was telling them here. Here's what you can know about me. I mean, he said it in these verses, like, you can know the fullness of God. Like, you're you're not just knowing some about Jesus. You're knowing some about all of God, the fullness of God, the oneness of God, the Father and the Son and the Spirit. You want to know know God? Well, if you know me, you know the Father, and he speaks plenty of other places, just got finished and will more about the spirit. You wanna, you wanna know the Father, Son, and Spirit, the beauty of God, the one God in three persons, the co-eternal, co-existing God, Father, Son, and Spirit. If you know me, you'll, you'll know God. You can know the fullness of God. What can be now known about God, you can know fully in Jesus. If you wanna know God, know, get to know Jesus. Father, Son, and Spirit, you'll know. The presence of God. He, Jesus says something really wild here. Don't you know the Father is in me and I'm in the Father? I mean, he's speaking about the indwelling presence of God. I mean, something for each one of us as we follow Jesus will happen in your life. If you 
are a follower of Jesus, if you put your faith in Jesus, something will happen in your life at some point as you keep following him, as you keep taking these steps. He will make you aware of his indwelling presence. It will, something will happen. You will one day realize, more than you ever have, the Spirit of God is living inside of me. I mean, Jesus said this, Romans 8, 11. The Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. And so Jesus here is saying, the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Like something is in me. Like what, the Father God sitting on the throne? No, the Spirit of God himself. The Father is in me and I am in the Father. Jesus is just in bodily form here. How's the Father in you? By this Holy Spirit of God. That's why Paul said in Romans 8, 11, the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. It's living in you. So Jesus says, don't you know me? Don't you know the Spirit of God living in you? in me? Don't you know these things about me? Don't you know me? So our pursuit becomes, I want to know Jesus. That's better than anything else. What else are you pursuing that's better than knowing Jesus? What is it in your life? Why are you here? Why are you living? Why are you existing? What are you after? You got to go to work? Sure. You want to give a good, good life to your family? Sure. But it doesn't, it doesn't compare at all to knowing Jesus. It's all worthless without knowing Jesus. If Jesus is at first and most and best, Everything else is a waste. Still got tryptophan in your body from the turkey? Come on, I need you with me. Preaching my guts out here. And y'all are just hanging in there. Uh Uh-uh. I'm waking you up. We got too much to do. And we got more. Look at this. What Jesus says. Oh, this is going to hurt some of us. Verse 10. Don't you believe that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father who is living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least least believe in the evidence of the miracles themselves. Jesus is saying this. Hey, the words that I speak to you, they're from the Father. They are authoritative, right? You see the words I speak to you, they're not my own. They're from the Father, When we alter the words of Jesus, we are no longer under his authority. Jesus is saying something here very important. Hey, have you heard my words? They're coming straight from the throne of God. Like Jesus even said, they're not even my own. Like I'm showing you submission to the authority of God from the words that I speak. The words I speak to you are authoritative. They're not even from me, they're from the Father. And so when I speak something to you, it is an authority that I even am showing you a submission to. In my bodily form, as I took on human flesh, I'm showing you, I'm speaking in submission to the authority of God. And so when we take the words of God and we change them or dismiss them, we are no longer under the authority of Jesus. Now this too is an attack against the church. Personal, close people in my life have taken the words of God and adjusted them, twisted them, dismissed them, changed them, altered them to make them fit their lives and they, I believe, are no longer under the authority of Jesus. You have people in your life who have done it too. It's all around us. It's happening. It's, it's a flood right now. And Jesus says, when I speak, I'm speaking words from the throne room of God. And those words are better than whatever you can conjure up. I read a post this week from a guy who I respect, and he said something like this. He said, every so often, every few generations, a couple of really smart people with some letters before and after their name will get together and they'll say, well, the Bible didn't really mean this when it said this, and this is what it really means, and people will start following this way or following this way, and it never lasts, it never works, because it's not true and it can't hold on. And Jesus says, look, I've spoken some words to you, and they are authoritative, so when I speak, you listen. And if you alter or omit the words of Jesus from your life, you're no longer living under the authority of Jesus. So we take this word, And 
There's a Greek word that says, I don't want to tell you because you don't care. We place ourselves under it. It's as if we're submitting to it, right? We take the word of God and it's authoritative in your life. If the word of God is not authoritative in your life, what is? What is? Culture, personal pleasure, your own logic and reason greater than the reason of God. I mean, do you believe that this is some dead book or it's living, it's eternal? God infused it by his spirit. I do, I'm living by it, and I hope you will too. If we alter the words of Jesus, we're no longer under his authority. In verse 12, Jesus said this, I'm gonna tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I've been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. What? What did Jesus just say? Hey, he said, look, believe in my words and also believe in my works. And then he said, hey, if you believe in me, you're gonna do greater works than me. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Surely I misread that, right? I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these. <laughs> what? You raised somebody from the dead. You fed thousands of people. I mean, what do you mean I'm gonna do greater things than these? I mean, of course, Jesus isn't talking about an individual doing greater things than these. He's saying his people will, this is what they'll do. He's, he's saying this to us. He, he, he left this world. He's like, hey, you're going to do greater works than these, than I did. I'm going to leave. He said, I'm going to the Father. I'm going to leave this world, and I'm going to leave my work to you. I'm going to leave this world, and I'm going to leave my work to you. And he, 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 he prefaced this by saying, if you believe in me, you're going to do greater work than I've done. So if you believe in me, you're going to be about the work that I've been doing. This is what he's been doing. What has Jesus been doing? He's been teaching truth. He's been spending a lot of time teaching. In fact, people wanted him to do other things, and he said, no, I gotta leave here and go teach. That's why I came. So teaching was the work of Jesus, teaching truth. That's the work of Jesus, right? Giving out a lot of grace to people. The Bible says that he was full of grace and full of truth. He didn't have some grace and some truth or one more than the other, he's full of grace and full of truth. He was giving out grace while also giving out truth. And then he was doing a lot of good. He was feeding people, healing people, helping people, loving people, spending time with people that nobody else would spend time with. Lepers and liars, thieves and prostitutes, I mean, drunkards. I mean, the people that people wouldn't spend time with, that's who Jesus did. He loved them, he did good stuff for people. So Jesus said, you're gonna actually do more than I've done. If you believe in me, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 talks about how we get saved. It's by grace we've been saved through faith. It's not a, of ourselves, it's a gift of God. It's not by works so that we can boast about how we get to God. But then the next verse, verse 10 says, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Like we're created in Christ Jesus to do good works. And some of us are like, what, what, what's, what am I missing? What? Jesus said, if you believe in me, you'll do greater things than me. Like, you're going to join together with all my people, and I just came here as one person in, in, in physical bodily form. I decided to take on human flesh, where I'd be in one place at one time. But you, you're going to spread around the world if you believe in me, and you're going to do greater things than I've ever done. And so if you believe in Jesus, you're going to join in his work. And some of us, we're not joined in his work. What's his work? sharing the truth, the gospel. That's why he came. Giving out grace to people who need it. Spending time with people who were lost and separated from God. And then doing all this good in the world that he told us to do. Feed the hungry. He's like, if you give a cup of water to a thirsty person, it's like you've done it to me. And so there's all this good available for us to do. And Jesus said, you'll do it too. And it'll end up being greater than the work that I've done. We gotta join in. What, what life are you waiting on? You believe in reincarnation? Oh, the next life I'm gonna come back and I'll, you know, maybe then I'll start doing some good for people. Maybe then I'll welcome prisoners when they get off the bus or I'll feed the homeless or, you know, I'll rescue babies off the streets in Westheimer. Or maybe then I'll help drill some water wells. Maybe my next life I'll do it. Maybe when I retire, maybe, you know what? I won't do anything for Jesus for 40 or 50 or 60 years, but then I'll spend my last few years doing it. I mean, what are you waiting on? 
we got to be about the work of Jesus. He said, if you believe in me, you will. And it's going to be great. So if you believe in Jesus, be about his work. He left this world and left his work to us. And he said, I'm going to be with you. My spirit's going to be in you. The same spirit that lived in me is going to live in you. And then finally, look at this. One of the most abused and damaging verses of scripture because of its misuse. Jesus said, you're going to do incredible things. And he said, verse 13, I'm going to do whatever you ask in my name so that the son may bring glory to the father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I'll do it. Ah, you want to light my fire? Abuse this verse. I hear it all the time. You attach the name of Jesus to something and expect the almighty God of the universe to do what you told him to do. Jesus, I declare that at the mall, during Christmas shopping holidays, I'll get a good parking spot. Happened to any of you? Didn't happen to me. I mean, people use the name of Jesus for whatever they want to, and they think it's a magic potion, a formula. Like, hey, Jesus said, ask for anything in my name and I'm gonna give it to you. And so you misuse it and abuse it, and then you get mad at God and leave him. Hey, I asked Jesus to heal this person and he didn't. So I don't believe him anymore. Ask him to give me that job, give me that raise. Heal my friend, my family member, my kid, my parent. I asked him to do this and he didn't do it. So I don't believe him anymore. We misused and abused the verse and then we reject God. We shake our fist at God because we misused the verse. We wanted to move the almighty God by attaching a name to a prayer or to an edict. God, you'll do this because I told you to in Jesus' name. And people say in Jesus' name for all kinds of things. I actually think when Jesus said, you're taking my name in vain, he probably meant this. You're using my name in vain. It's empty. It's meaningless. It's not what I meant it for. And what did Jesus say here? Well, I don't know exactly. I don't think it's like, I say whatever I want and I say the name of Jesus and I'm gonna get that. It can't be that, right? It can't be that. So what do we know? It's gotta be in Jesus' name. It's gotta be about Jesus and for Jesus. It's gotta be about his work and his ways and his will. It's gotta be in the name of Jesus, something that, yes, represents him. And it's gotta be for the glory of the Father. That's what he said here. I do it in my name so that the Father may be glorified. Like, you know, what are we praying for? Are we praying that the name of Jesus will be greater through this, through me, through my life, and that the Father may be glorified? That's how he wants us to pray. Jesus, I want your name to be greater. So will you let me be a part of this? Will you do this so that your name will be greater in my city, greater with my friends, greater with people around me? I want your name to be greater and I want God to be glorified in people's lives. I want him to be lifted up and their knees bowed to him. That's what we're praying for. That's how we pray. Is that how you're praying? What are we praying for? We're praying for lesser things. So let's pray as Jesus told him to. We're gonna ask for things that the name of Jesus may be lifted up. And church, my prayer for us as a church is that we'll be praying this way. Jesus, would you do these things among us so the name of Jesus will be glorified so people that aren't singing songs to Jesus will soon be singing songs to Jesus. People who aren't glorifying God in their life will soon glorify God in their life. Let's be a church that prays like this. Would you stand with me? as we reflect on what we've heard and respond.